We are now recording. All right, Betty. Good let's go ahead and morning, breakfast. Speaker. Good morning, breakfast clubbers. I, it is my distinct honor and absolute with excitement to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Evian Gordon is the founder, executive chairman, and CMO of Total Brain. He founded the first and largest standardized international database on the human brain. The database is the asset which shaped TotalBrain.com for brain fitness, mental health, and peak performance. It's used in over 40 major companies and in over uh, 800,000 employees, including Boeing, AARP, Cerner, and IBM. His presentation will be on how to boost your memory, focus, and calm. And I would like to give a very warm Golden Gate Breakfast Club welcome. Please help me introducing Evian, Dr. Evian Gordon. Welcome. Good morning to you all. <clears throat> Thank you, Betty, um, for your introduction. I am sitting in um, Betty's home. My wife and I rent a home in uh, Spinnaker Point. And I do miss my, the hectic office in the Hearst building where our team works, <clears throat> part of our team works, uh, most of the other people are in New York. But um, it's a great blessing to me, Betty, to be living on the water in what seemed like a bird sanctuary. So um, the peace and calm that this place has brought us is just uh, hugely appreciated. And thank you for inviting me thank to speak this morning. I do feel under a little more pressure than usual because um, Patricia Fripp said that um, you need, to, you need to start any talk with an interesting stat or a little known fact or else it's gonna bomb. And so um, I don't have an interesting fact or a, um, a little known fact. So I apologize in advance for uh, what's clearly gonna be a less engaging talk. But I do have an idea and it's not a, it's not a new idea. It's a very old idea. And I think we all know it, that the biggest gap we have in our brains is the gap between knowing and doing. Now, what I hope to share with you in the next few minutes is that the, in addition to all the obvious things about being ready to change and to learn memory better and focus and calm, which is what I'm briefly gonna talk about, I'm gonna suggest a specific other strategy that may sound a little radical, but it's that the way to retrain the brain and you know, the brain's got 85 billion neurons between our ears. It's a cosmos. It's unbelievable. But to rewire specific aspects of that cosmos is super doable, but it needs extreme training. And what I mean by that is just instead of going through the motions, which is what I think most people do, you know, we have 50,000 thoughts a day we can reshape many of those from negative to positive to more constructive thoughts. But to do that, change requires an immersiveness and a laser-like focus that within a week you could do and see for yourself. So I'll, I'll leave you to judge whether my extreme philosophy, I'm 67 years old, I've become more radical as I've got older because this insight has helped me reshape pretty much everything I do from the way that I contribute to our international consortium on the brain, to the way I eat, <clears throat> to the way, and I love the posture, talk, everything. If you focus on it with a clarity of purpose can rewire your brain for real at any age. So it's not just how you train, what you train, it's how you train. And that's essentially what I hope is the more important takeaway because there's nothing we haven't heard or know about memory focus or calming that we haven't heard. What I hope to share with you is how to use those three elements together in a strategic way that's super personal for you to really get that rewiring your brain happening. So I want to start off with just a quick snapshot about, you know, and, and give credit to Eric Kendall, the, the Nobel Prize laureate who discovered how memory works. And he did that from a snail. I mean, it's incredible. The, the, the way in which science works from this microscopic level where he disentangled 
the exact way, well, as best as we know today, obviously science is just an unfolding story of increasing testable insights. But he did this remarkable thing where all, all those words at the bottom are just the mechanisms of how we go from getting our neurons that fire together, wire together. So we just got to really think about that. When we want to learn something, if we really fire the neurons together in a, in a focused, granular way, you don't learn memory or positivity or calmness by just thinking about it generally, even though that's helpful. Attitude matters. But what makes it work is this rewiring. And to get that, you've got to have the thinking together that wires together. And he elucidated the mechanisms of how it works. And essentially, as you all probably know, there, there, there are kind of multiple types of memory. But, but the important part to really retrain, to, to take away, is that there's a, what's called a working memory, which you kind of works over seconds, where you're kind of putting the thoughts together. It's like a sketch pad. And then there's a structure in our brain, the, the little blue structure here on the picture, called the hippocampus, which converts that memory from a sort of short-term memory, starts to convert it to wire, the proteins start to wire about that memory. And it then becomes available for the long-term. And we can all do that all day, every day, if, and it's a huge if, we really focused about it. And then there kind of, in addition to this working memory and this longer term recall memory, there's also emotional memory. And I want to just show you one little snapshot from our database. It's a little overwhelming, but I show it to you not to overwhelm you with all this information we collect about the brain around the world from everything that moves from genetics to how you mem remember. But I want you to go to the little black box at the bottom. This is a picture of data over thousands of people. There are a million data sets in the, in the database. But it's really to show that with age, if you can look at the top there, it says age from 10 to, it's actually from six to 100. Of course we all know, I'm 67, I'm starting to forget stuff all the time, but I keep reinforcing through the little two strategies I'm gonna share with you, what's important to me. I just keep reinforcing them. And what gives me confidence that this is real, this is not words, this is not, uh, you know, go through the motions, ideas that there's a deep underlying way in which our brain works. There's the, the outer mantle of our brain is actually starting to lose nerves and connections as we get older. But the deep structures in our brain that control our memory, our, our emotion, our emotional memory and our feelings, um, they don't decline at the same rate. So I want to leave you with there's the little red means it's getting worse over age and the green is staying stable, these deeper structures. And what's important about that in my mind is that we should draw upon what is preserved naturally. So as memory declines, emotions improve with age. Same as our ability to get smarter, see the patterns that matter. And so to draw on those emotional pieces, networks, for when we want to train our memory focus or calmness, is an, it's just another little, there's, there's a little, little factoid, Patricia, that you may want to think of. Okay, so on to memory training. We all know there are two big strategies about memory. You want to chunk pieces up into small bits, like uh, the rules of three, and you want to associate what you want to remember with something super novel. So let's go through those slowly. So if we want to first to train, and by the way, I am going to um, selfishly re re um, refer to the Total Brain platform, which you've been given free access to at totalbrain.com forward slash try. Um, simply because there are tools there that you can try for free. These are tools used by like over 800,000 people now, but bigger, bigger ecosystems now as IBM and other big factors or big, big networks are using them. But anyway, the principles is these tools are available and I've labeled them so you can see for yourself if you want to use those or any others that there are many, many tools on, on the web. This just happens to be an integrated platform. But with working memory, so this first chunking why would you want to remember numbers well i want to remember my my passwords which is the modern day version of remembering telephone numbers and of course if we have we know all know that it's we sort of remember numbers and facts it's a rule called the five plus or minus two it's very hard for the brain to remember details like that beyond about five or seven so if we go to the second last line there you know six three nine 818-531, if I just say those numbers to you that this is your password or something, 639-818-531, it's hard to remember, but there's a little training tool <coughs> called memory sequence, 
where you can remember the numbers and the colors, but it's about training our brains to remember patterns by chunking them. So remembering them in three. So if you could look at the second last line and chunk it up in three. So six, three, nine, eight, one, eight, five, three, one. But instead of that, think about it as six, three, nine, eight, one, eight, five, three, one. And you're more likely to remember anything if you chunk it up in little pieces. And then the other obvious strategies that you add to that, like rhyming, if you go 639-818-531, if you think about it as a tune that is familiar to you, your brain remembers patterns. The brain is a pattern machine. We remember patterns of everything much more effectively than we do just facts. So that's the simple training tool and I'll come to the extremism in a moment. Chunk any information you want, whether it's numbers, whether it's facts that are important to you, and then build other strategies that work for you. Because the more you, the more touch points you have through your eyes, through your hearing, write it out, the more likely you're gonna remember and consolidate the memories to you that matter. Okay, second strategy is what we all know, associations. If I want to remember somebody's face, their name, and their occupation, I can do so by the right association. So what does that mean? Because the associations mean you're connecting facts, which may, and a pattern, and a picture, which means you're more likely to connect, to recall it, than if it's just the, sort of the person's face. So here's a face of a person. Her name is Susan Grantham. And she's a fundraiser. So I want to remember her name associated with her face and what she does. So what's an example of associations with her? And I do want to say that the more novel the association, the more likely your brain will remember it. The brain loves novelty. So, um, but it's about associations that matter. And you want to do this obviously only for faces, names, people that you want need to remember. So if we go to Susan Grantham, the way I remember her name and her face is her S in her name is a dollar sign. So why do I think of that association of a dollar sign for Susan? Because she's a fundraiser. So immediately I make the association from her name as the dollar sign, and it immediately connects me now to her job as the fundraiser. And I remember her warm, smiley face, and that in a sense is also a positive association emotionally for me. And she's a warm person, and she's not, she's kind of appropriate. You can just get the sense. I get a sense of how she feels as a person because, you know, as Murray Angelo said, we will not really remember what people do. We will not remember what people say, but we will always remember the way people make us feel. And that's my point about emotion preservation. If we draw on the feelings, it also enhances the likelihood of the memory being rewired as a pattern and preserved. Okay, so what about extreme training? What am I talking about? Well, if we think about so many things going on in our brains, 50,000 thoughts a day, how do we get from the generalities and the moving from the gap, this huge gap between knowing and doing, and the specific granular way you can rewire anything, and I mean anything, and within a week, you could really, for real, see it. I know at the beginning of the preamble to the meeting, somebody said from the, the wonderful talk they heard last time about posture, they said, you've given me a thought that'll change my, will be for life. And that's it. If in one meeting, that person had changed their posture, rewired it, because they saw obviously the speaker was obviously convincing enough that it was so obvious and so powerful. Small things do matter. So the, the mechanism that I want to end off with is the combination of doing memory and focus and calm. So it means that the key points to remember about extreme training is you really want to immersively, you want to start with the end in mind. What does that mean? You don't want to just train for the sake of You want to think very, very explicitly. I'm improving my memory so I can remember people's names and faces because my job is hardly dependent on that. That'll change the way in which you train. I want to start with the end in mind. If I want to get focused, I want to be better at finishing things. That's why I want to improve my focus. And if I want to get more calm, it's because 
I don't want most of my 50,000 thoughts every day to be caught in the fight flight stress system that it's so easy to get hijacked by in the COVID era and beyond. I want to find strategies to switch in the moment from negative thoughts that are breaking my concentration and disturbing me to more positive ones. So at the end of the day, when I start with the end in mind, when I say, how many strategies did I have today that worked, that worked, that worked. It's all about translation into the real world. So that's being immersive in the moment, the chunking and associations we've mentioned, and then the focus for task completion, the calm brain hacks, and I want to end up with something we all know about, nutrition and exercise, but I want to tell you why that really matters for memory. So let's just quickly run through the two. So starting with the end in mind is obvious, and immersing in the moment we've discussed, chunking and associations are the mechanism. So let's think about focus. So in the, in the, the, the Total Brain app platform, there's a tool there, Think Focus, and it's just so basic. It's the story about, oh, you think you can stand up with your posture and breathe properly, but yet it's tiny. If you focus on keeping that ball targeted on the target, but you train with the associative thought that says, I am focusing on this little tool to make sure that I remind myself that I do small steps in a task to think about completing it, completing it, completing it. It's about task completion. And for those of you who want to watch the Total Brain podcast, there's a wonderful man, um, Glenn Elliott, the professor of pediatrics at Stanford, who gave a podcast last week on how people with attention deficit, it's not just they can't attend, it's troubling for them to complete the task, to stay with it with small steps. And he gives the most incredible story about how he got his son, Mark, to go from having quite challenging ADHD to being a specialist for uh, um, psychiatrist and addiction uh, 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 clinician today. It, it, you can rewire amazing amounts of things with that simple task alone. So train focus, but then bring it across to the way you're doing your memory. Are you writing down the things at the end of the day that you did change through chunking and association? What are your most important facts? Are you putting them into a system in your mind? Patterns matter. So if you have a framework, the best framework in my mind, of course, is the framework of the brain, but that's another issue. Because then you can remember things more obviously. Your left side of your brain is about detail. The right side of your brain is about pattern. And then the other layers, the emotions are deep within your brain. But if you think about it, it just provides a wonderful framework for you to associate and think, and think about and remember things. But people build their own frameworks, doesn't matter what it is, but you should have one. What is the strategy, the, the sort of, the the storage framework where I'm putting that information should not be all over the place. The difference between a peak performer, we deal with a lot of peak performers in sport, but in life, in business, executives, many CEOs, and the point of it is that the ones who are really good performers they have a framework. That's the biggest difference between them. The way they train and they have a good framework. So they're not like dilettantes who know lots of cool stuff, but it's like all over the place. Frameworks mean you see how it works and you can put the key pieces together. Less is more, but you've got to know which less. So that's focus. I want to go to why is, we all know why stress is so important. How many times have you, 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 approach somebody at a work function and you just can't remember their name. You just cannot, and you've got to introduce them. Well, a lot of that is that stress hijacks the brain. We see it in the COVID era. Uh, we're just seeing data all over the country now of the enormous implications of stress hijacks. And we see them in our daily life. So by having a strategy, not just to be calm, people go, oh, be calm, meditate, just switch off. Of course, that's important. And meditation and these general ways of switching off are wonderful. But in the moment, what strategy do you have right now when you can't remember that person's name to switch off the stress that's hijacking your, your sketch pad and you can't quite find the bits? And there's a simple strategy that I'm very grateful for my collaborators, um, Dick Gewertz and others at, uh, in San Diego University, Allianz University, for highlighting the fact that there's a remarkable breathing rate at six breaths a minute 
that will be is the most, I mean, we just aggregate stuff all up from all around the planet and what works. And this breathing rate at six breaths per minute, you can train it on this breathing bar called Micron Beat in the, in the, in the, in the platform, it switches off your stress system better than any other natural mechanism we've seen. And there's lots of deep reasons why it works. But the important thing is it's in the moment. So here's an example. I'm just going to play this video. I'll pull my sound out. Some cool sounds and stuff. But follow the breathing bar with me if you could. Just for three breaths. At six breaths per minute. Um, Okay, so if um, Susan Grantham walks up to me at a function and I, <clears throat> I can't remember the S dollar sign in her name or her name or the or what job she does, <clears throat> excuse me, as a fundraiser, I will take three breaths in the moment because I've trained, I've trained every morning. I will not leave the house as my part of my extreme training until I've done 10 minutes of this breathing at six breaths per minute. The benefits last for most of the day. But when I cannot remember Susan's name, I will simply, without making a fuss, just simply breathe at three breaths, at that six breaths a minute, pull my shoulders back, coming back to posture, very powerful, put you in a different growth mindset, it switches you, switch off your fight flight stress system, it switches you into your alternative system called the calm flexible system known as the vagus, V-A-G-U-S. It's as basic as that. But the gap between knowing and doing is sometimes hard to bridge. This is one of the most effective ways in the moment to do it. And lastly, but by no means least, I do want to say that we should all know a lot about this because we all privileged to live in a space. We're one of the key innovators in helping, um, I'll just put my speaker back on. I'll just put my, my speaker. One of the key innovators who's helped really highlight this, Dean Ornish, lives uh, in, the, in the Bay Area, in uh, Sacramento, I believe. But he, if you haven't seen him, just check him out on, the, on, on uh, YouTube, Dean Ornish, O-R-N-I-S-H. I urge you to read all his books. And the point of the matter is, who doesn't know that good food and exercise is good for you? But it's more than that. It's about being a little extreme, not a lot. I have another group I work with called uh, Charles Darwin's great, great grandson <clears throat> called the Darwin app, the Darwin challenge. And the Darwin challenge, you can go to free app, will just tell you how much benefit you get for yourself and for the planet by just eating no meat one day a week. And what Dean is saying is that really looking to a whole food plant-based diet is such a powerful way of removing the inflammatory markers that are really challenging to us. And with exercise, we deal with a, a number of groups looking at exercise in the brain. It's not just that you increase the blood flow to your brain, but with a little bit of intense exercise, not a lot. I mean, for me, I'm not a big exercise person, but I do just push myself a little for one minute. And in that one minute, there's evidence if you just push yourself every day a little to wherever your comfort zone is, just a little to the boundary out of your comfort zone. <clears throat> we all know about interval training. There's more. I'm not talking about the level of extremism of all. I'm talking about just get yourself out of the comfort zone, get, get, a, get yourself to the, that level where you, you switched into an intense mode. It, you start rewiring new connections in your brain. Now, what Dean is doing, and I do not want to make any claims about this or predict his outcome, but he showed that with this kind of diet and exercise um, and stress reduction, they were the big things, and social connectivity, he has demonstrated for many years now, 20 years, that... Um, you can reverse atherosclerosis in the heart. My PhD was in serum lipids in the heart before I switched to the brain. And this is an amazingly important insight. By the way, I'm a person who ate terribly and exercised poorly. And I still, I mean, I'm not great, but I, I'm so, taking this so seriously now because I've seen that even within a week, you can start some of that reversal. 
So he showed that people who've got blockages of their arteries can literally reverse it <coughs> with this. And so, my father, and now he's doing the same, he's doing a big study now to see the extent to which we can reverse some of the, the mild cognitive impairment changes that precede Alzheimer's, of course. And of course, there are many claims about that, and I don't want to add to those claims. Just to say that there's some deep heavyweight thinking now coming into the fact that we can bring all these pieces together. Sorry, I'll just put that last slide on again. And um, I'll end off with that, that if you can think about um, extreme training and slowly bringing together the strategies that work for you, for your 50,000 talk today, but particularly the strategies you will use to get the right associations for the facts that matter to you, write them down at the end of the day if you can, um, it's hard to get that sort of discipline, but once you've got it, it's easy. And then think about calming yourself in the moment with three breaths and a little bit of training in the morning and before you go to sleep. And it, you can add it into your meditation, Tai Chi, yoga, and whatever other way you want. It's just a lovely new scientific insight to add to 2,500-year-old ideas about sleep, breathing slowly and being calm and meditating. And lastly, train your focus about being about finishing tasks and not going through the motion so that you find a way to bridge the gap and move across that bridge from knowing to doing. And with that, I will invite any questions. I'm, I'm really glad Tony's recording this because um, there's so much good information here, Ed. Well, thank you, Craig. Um, one, one observation, maybe you can take your screenshot off Go. and then we can move to uh, tile view and let's open it up for questions. Okay. I see. Um, you go ahead. Janice, go ahead. You had a question. I can't. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm unmuted. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Evian. <clears throat> so I do a lot of thinking about this. Uh, I speak about stress and changing our behavior from the inside out. And you use the phrase knowing and bridging the knowing doing gap. For me, that means teaching people how to get motivated to change their behavior intrinsically. And so I, well, I didn't quite make that connection between <clears throat> your reference to knowing doing and my reference to knowing doing. Oh, that's a wonderful additional point, Janice. Thank you. So the point about that is to also that people need to be, get themselves to be ready to change. And so we all, you know, we, we think we're ready, but there's four stages of readiness. And so you want to get to the point if, and not be, you know, not be uncomfortable. If you're not ready, you're not ready. Then you need to move to the stages as to what gets you to be ready. And, you know, what's really been interesting about the COVID era, of course, is that what we also see in the database is that um, people usually require something quite extreme sometimes where they're more likely to change, like a trauma or a challenge like COVID. It's also an opportunity where we all hijacked, our brains are hijacked, but it's also an opportunity for change, for reframing and to thinking about um, a way of doing some of the changes that are important to us. So getting ready is important. Of course, we, none of us want to have to draw on extreme circumstances. I know <clears throat> there are a lot of my friends and people who have, who have become addicted and they, to stuff and, and then they change when they feel like they've, they've reached the end, like they're ready to change because they expect. But then there are other ways where you want to change because it just makes sense. I mean, why would we eat unhealthily? Why would we not exercise and train our brains a little bit immersively? So there are ways where people just come to that aha moment. But being ready, Janice, and getting ready is as important as actually that first step where you're now starting small steps every day. Um, that get you along the line to generate a new habit. But yeah, I couldn't agree with your content. Thank you. I have a comment, if I might. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Ricky. But hey, before you go on, um, Tony, are you still there? I know Tony, Tony needs to be. Yeah. Tony, why don't you go ahead and mute everybody? There's some background noise. Thank you very much for your presentation today. It was very uh, illuminating. Um, the story that I always remember about Will Rogers, apparently Will Rogers was terrible at remembering names. 
but he always would remember a snippet of conversation that he had had with this person that he can't remember the name. And he would bluster right by the fact that I don't remember your name by reminding the guy, you know, you were right when you said whatever. And that sort of gets us by the whole name thing and everybody's smiling and moving forward. So I just thought that was worth sharing. Oh, that's such a great example, Rick. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> there's an example about people just keeping calm and using what they, what they work with. You know, the whole field of positive psychology has taught us one thing. They left us with such a great legacy from their point of view, which was focus on our strengths. Like most people focus on their weaknesses because they are, oh, I do not want that weakness. That's what I'm going to focus on. But that example, Rick, of focusing on what you can do and then building on that. So if you can remember snippets of information as your friend did, uh, as Rogers did, that's so interesting because that's what worked for him as the trigger to then associate the other pieces over time, I'm sure. But a great example and great emotional example about how emotions also have their own kind of language, their own way of operating in our brain. So very interesting. I want to add one other thing, Rick, and, and I, I know that Patricia all over this. You know, when people are taught to remember, that Romans came for a long time ago, came up with visualizing, they called it the room they remember their room because they couldn't knew that so familiar and they associated in their room an important point they wanted to make in their speech with each object in their room so when they wanted to really give their presentation with no notes because being persuasive was so important in those days and still is um, and so the ability to just take something as basic as your room and as you and I've tried this many times and it's fascinating where you then just say, my first point I want to make is about the chair at my desk. And I've associated that with saying the gap between knowing and doing. And then the second point I want to say is, you know, um, the, the, the workout mat on, 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 at the, on my floor. And that is the second point I want to make is about extremism matters. I mean, uh, you know, in this targeted, defined way. So you go around and instead of PowerPoints or notes, you just visualize the story, the narrative. We remember narratives. We remember visual pictures. And so there's another example, Rick, where the emotional connection of a small little vignette or, or, or interesting fact or visualizing things about ourselves that we associate very important facts to. These strategies all start converging into the extreme cauldron that I think makes it makes learning, memory, focus, and calmness not only doable, but super interesting. I mean, I find it like a, an incredible puzzle every day when I just do a little bit of this. And I'm not, I mean, I don't, I'm not one of those people who pretends that they're that great at this, but, you know, I am a bit of the do what I, I do, what I say, not what I do, but I, I am sort of doing it. And every time I do it, I'm amazed at how interesting it is. I thought, this is wacky. And so it's fun. And, I, and people roll their eyes sometimes. I know my kids do. When I say the greatest fun you could ever do is the brain stuff. And you know, they kind of roll their eyes, but, but it is. Uh, and that's my point and I'm sticking to it. Um, Evian, it's Betty. Um, thank you for a wonderful presentation. And so the calming and the breathing, does that also, or can that also work when you're not just remembering names, but just trying to remember um, well, I guess it's the name, name of a book or what somebody said on television that morning in the news. I mean, it's, that's the hardest thing as is forgetting things as um, I get older, uh, things that I should remember. And it's, it's then I get nervous or anxious because I can't remember it and then it makes it worse. So sometimes it takes a while for that thought or name to come from, I like to say it's coming from the back forward for me to articulate it. Any comments on that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Betty. That's spot on. So the issue, I mean, again, this is just one strategy, that breath at six breaths per minute, because it's got, we've measured your brain function and heart rate variability. We just know that that is a switch. So whether it's remembering somebody's name or remembering some factors you said, but also, Betty, we also find it really powerful when people are thinking about how they want to switch their negative thoughts to positive thoughts. Mm -hmm. So even that, when somebody's going, oh, I'm thinking about that negative thought again, and mm -hmm. I'm magnifying it, and some people catastrophize it, and it, it drives them nuts and makes them very ineffectual and less <clears throat> effective than they could be. So even in those circumstances, Betty, that switch. So we, everybody in the field now calls it brain hacking. And to brain hack in the moment, 
whether it's breathing at six breaths per minute, or frankly, I'd say some people just use body language. They found from the posture, wonderful posture example, that even just pulling your shoulders back slightly versus stooping, you're in two different brain states. So even that, Betty, is another example that people might find you know, equally effective. Mm -hmm. So, but the key thing I think in this issue, Betty, is to find whatever strategies work for you in the moment. You know, these thoughts, Betty, these, these, these thoughts that hijack us non-consciously, these emotional thoughts, we've measured them actually, and they happen in a fifth of a second. I mean, that's incredibly quickly. So we get hijacked so quickly. So having strategies that help us mm -hmm. to brain hijack ourselves into a calmer, more focused, better memorizing state is the key or a key. So your point, Betty, is that it applies to everything. It doesn't just apply to memory. Thank you. Hey, uh, Evian, we're, um, we're at 834 right now, and some of our members are going to need to leave. Um, but I, there are actually a few other people wanted to ask some questions. Patricia and Aurora have, um, you know, have questions for you. So what I'd like to do is um, why don't we uh, close the, the official meeting off now so that we can, uh, whoever needs to go take care of other business can do that. And then, um, you know, Evian, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a little while, it, it was a fantastic presentation. So I don't mute so we can listen to them. Yeah, it was oh, so thank you. you know. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Great pleasure to be here, by the way. What a great club. Just fabulous. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we, you're, you're, you're fantastic. And you're welcome to come back anytime. And, thank uh, you so much, Craig. I'll know. stay on with pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, everybody, you know, wanted to thank you for joining us at the Golden Gate Breakfast Club today. And, um, you know, we're going to be doing this again next week. So we're looking forward to that. Tony, do you want to say something about our speaker next week? Next week? I don't know. I don't remember who it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hey, having a you have to take three, three deep breaths. Yeah. Three deep breaths, Tony. Three deep breaths. I'm having well, a so. I can tell you, okay, I can tell you, Andrew, Andrew Gunther is going to be here with us, a scientist. He's going to be talking about climate change. And then following that, Aurora is going to be back. So um, we'll look forward to hearing what Aurora Bataclan has to say. And then also I'll take this opportunity to mention that we do have a board meeting coming up on June 2nd, and I'll be sending out a notice about that. But if you're a board member here, just put that on your, your calendar and know that's coming up. And we also are looking at doing another, a second leadership, interclub leadership meeting uh, so that we can start working closer with the other Bay Area clubs. And Evian, that might be good for you if you want to expand your message to other clubs, then, you know, we certainly, you know, can make some introductions for you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, again, thanks for joining us today. It's been a fantastic presentation. You have a great Thank rest of the day. Have a good day. Have a good.